Good afternoon, everyone. This seems awfully quiet, yeah? Hello? Whoa. Yeah. Phil Donahue style, right? Walking around. I wanted to walk around anyway. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Matt. I uh, work at a company called Lullabot. Uh, we're doing a uh, talk here about PCI compliance and how it would apply to your Drupal sites. So this is kind of really what we want, right? It's the end game. Everybody wants to be able to c collect credit card data or at least collect payments on their website because, hey, making money is fun, right? E-commerce is kind of the goal. Here's a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing Drupal for about five years, and I'm going to tell the story today a little bit about uh, my past in doing PCI from the trenches, if you will. Um, I'm a member of the Drupal security team, and I'm a senior development at a company called Lullabot. Uh, we've had the great opportunity to work with a lot of these cool companies, but a lot of my PCI experience doesn't come from Lullabot, for what it's worth. But who am I not, right? I am not a PCI DIA, uh, qualified security assessor. I'm not a QSA. Just wanted to throw that out there right now. I'm also not a lawyer. And uh, today, I'm not going to be willing to provide references for web hosting, scanning vendors, consultants, that kind of thing. I'm not sure that that's uh, a discussion that can lead to anything productive. So we'll just avoid that kind of talk today. I will tell you a little bit of a story. Back from my previous job, I was in the nonprofit world doing web development, doing Drupal development. And I had a coworker come down the hall and give me one of these looks. Matt? Yeah. You've been doing some really great Drupal work. Yeah. I hear this makes websites easy. Oh, well, yeah, I suppose so. Regina is in charge of the development department. She wants fundraising to happen. And there are things that she wants fundraising wise on her website. And there's a way that she wants it to work. Regina explained to me that, you know, I, I really need to collect credit card information. And I need that information to get plugged into our database because our database does the recurring billing. We have this fancy database and, you know, it's got all of our customer records in it. It's got all their history in it. And uh, being able to plug it right in there um, off of our website that collects credit card data and, you know, maybe charge the card the first time. So if they're making a, a donation to us right away. And I thought, yeah. Why not, right? It's forms. I know Drupal form API. Uh, there are plenty of other ways to, to go about this in Drupal. I'd love to be able to integrate this directly with our database system, but you know, I'm not all that familiar with that API, and it's very complicated and probably doesn't want to play well with PHP anyway. So I go back to my desk, and I kick back a little bit, start running through the Google. Honestly, that probably is about what my desk looked like. Um, start running through Google thinking, OK, we're dealing with credit cards. It's something that's new to me. It's uh, probably going to be a little bit difficult, and I, I definitely want to do it the right way, right? Especially if I'm going to be storing credit cards. And I started scratching my head on that one a little bit. It's like, you know, boy, this is going to be a secure data. It's pretty, pretty, I mean, there's going to be a need for some pretty secure data store. I better make sure I do that right. And the uh, server that I have running, you know, in the, in the supply room, running my, our, my other little microsites, probably wouldn't be a good idea to do it there. So, hmm and security and encryption, trying to figure out all these things. And I ran across a document that probably looked about like that. And I started reading it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough one. And I thought, wow, this is uh, very detailed. There's a lot of good information here. And it's probably going to tell me the right way to do it. But it's not going to be as easy as I initially thought. So I got on the phone and I called my boss. I called Bob. And I said, Bob, you know, Regina came down the hall and described this great project to me, and it's going to help fundraising out a bit, and it's really going to help 
our position, you know, in, in, the, in the company, you know, being the IT folks, you're always trying to help people out because you're always telling people no and telling them, you know, don't break their computer and that kind of thing. And Bob, I'd really like to be able to do this, but I found this thing called PCI. And uh, it's probably going to affect the way we're dealing with credit cards in the organization otherwise. And, you know, there are probably some challenges that are going to have to come about. And about that time, you know, that's about what that phone call started to look like. And Bob started getting upset, not about what I was saying, but knowing that he was probably going to have to spend the next year or so of his life sitting in conference rooms about like this, discussing it. Because one thing that PSI, or PCI isn't, it's not a, just a problem for the IT staff, it's not just a problem for the people who are collecting credit card information, it's really going to affect anyone's organization or anyone's business, business-wide. Everyone in the organization will probably see at least some touch of PCI. So PCI is the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, the PCI DSS. That's what we're talking about here today primarily. So the payment card industry consists of the major card payment brands who came together and decided that this is going to be one standard that will rule them all. It's going to be the way that it will be done properly, and this is what we were going to expect of everyone because originally everybody tried to go off on their own tangent and say this is the way Visa wants to do it, this is the way MasterCard wants to do it, and they decided that getting it all together in one list of standards is probably the best way of going about it, and that document is the PCI Data Security Standard. It's also important to point out that the uh, PCI DSS is not a law. Uh, it's not legislation enforced by the government, anything like that. It's only the credit card companies that hold these policies over us. This is the, probably the most important thing if you're interested in PCI. If you're charging, transmitting, processing, or storing credit card data, it applies to you, period. But I'm not storing it, you're right, it applies to you. But I'm using SSL, guess what, it applies to you. You're going to probably have to go a little bit further into the way that you're currently doing things to uh, make sure you're doing it along the, right, uh, along the lines that the uh, PCI DSS asks you to do. In the end, we really just want to avoid data breaches, right? That's an article that's probably a little difficult to read, but I'm not expecting you to read it. Talking about the Heartland payment system, it's a very famous data breach from a few years ago. Tons of credit card information was stolen, but they're a pen, but they are a payment vendor, but it's something that has really affected them, right? Uh, dozens of lawsuits, uh, formal inquiries by federal organizations. Um, of course, it affects their stock value. That's a huge example, and you probably don't process that many credit cards. So you're thinking, you know, I'm just the little guy here, right? I, I am not Heartland. I am not, uh, you know, Walmart. I am not Amazon. I'm just the little guy trying to sell T-shirts on my uh, Ubercart store. You have to keep in mind that most of the examples of unauthorized access to sensitive information like credit card data come from the little guys. And the little guys make up most of the vendors. Also, there are people looking for you. About a third of data breaches come out of malicious attacks. So it's also something that's going to be uh, pretty expensive for you if uh, something bad were to happen. And here might be uh, a good thing for you to see, that the credit card provider can then become liable if the retailer was PCI compliant. If you're doing things the right way, you can rest assured that things will be out of your hands. Here's another major data breach that you probably all heard of within the last year or so. Uh, the Sony network lost a lot of information. And I'm not gonna say that this, I mean, I'm sure this affected them financially, without a doubt. But I think, in my opinion, this probably affected them on a reputational level more than a financial level. This came across my Twitter feed. And if you read what uh, my friend Sean has to say, you might think he's a little bit nutty. There's I, uh, access from an IP on China on my box because of the PlayStation um, breach. Now, I would think that too if I didn't know that Sean was the former CTO of a publicly traded software company and definitely was the propeller head and kind of knows what he's talking about. Is this really true? Is this what happened? I don't know, but really it doesn't matter because in today's social world, 
this is the kind of thing that people are going to see. This is what I remember from that actual exploit. So there's a financial risk that vendors have. A data breach will cost you in, in fees as well as uh, uh, perhaps fines and suits. But there's that reputational risk as well. And you need to make sure that you're dealing with uh, your client's payment information, personal information, in the best manner possible. So hopefully I've convinced you that this is actually probably a good thing, right? That we have these 12 requirements set forth by the PCI Council that are going to outline the best ways for us to handle sensitive credit card data and information. We like to call them the dirty dozen. Anyway, I'm gonna run through the 12 really quickly. We won't have time to get into a lot of detail, but keep in mind all of this information is out there and you can um, go read it for yourself. I'm just gonna touch on the 12 requirements fairly quickly. You'll find that a lot of them are really security best practices. Um, and it's something that you probably should be doing anyway, but uh, this is making sure that you understand that. For example, requirement number one, you need your firewall to, con to protect your cardholder data, right? Everybody should have a firewall. You probably have a firewall anyway. One thing that the requirement does say is that it does need to be a stateful firewall, um, and it needs to be configured properly, and you'll have to document that configuration. Um, but, right, who doesn't want a firewall in the first place? Yay, a firewall. Now, requirement number two is another one that is going to kind of sound like a no-brainer. But don't use vendor supply defaults for your system passwords and security parameters. This is another one of those, yeah, really? People do that? Right, you're, you're, you're going to log onto your computer and you look for a Wi-Fi network and you see one called Linksys and you think, huh, the password is admin and there's no username. I can get into this one, right? The, the same holds true to a lot of other network equipment as well. You need to make sure that you're not subject to doing silly things like this. Requirement number three is protect car stored car cardholder data. Requirement number three has to do with uh, a lot of the encryption that might take place behind the scenes, as well as what types of data are OK to store, what types of data are not OK to store. Um, it's, it's a fairly interesting one to read, actually, requirement number three. Number four is encrypting the transmission. A lot of times you hear people say, yeah, I use SSL. And uh, so I, I must be doing things right. Um, yeah, great. You're all set with requirement number four, um, 11 to go. Requirement number five, um, you need to up use and update your antivirus software and programs. You have to keep in mind that the PCI DSS was written for a very broad scope of possible applications. Right? This could be a uh, desktop application that someone from data entry is going through the mail, entering credit card data, submitting some kind of form that's going off to the payment gateway, and perhaps logging that that tracks the transaction happened. So on that Windows machine, you definitely want that to happen. And actually, the standard says you need to have an antivirus on types of OSs that don't, that, uh, you don't need to have an antivirus on types of OSs that are not subject to uh, viruses, trojans, that kind of thing, and the example that it gives is a mainframe. Good times. Requirement number six, develop and maintain secure systems and applications. This really has to do with how you're developing your software, your practices uh, for dev staging and release. Code reviews really come in in requirement number six, is uh, just kind of making sure that you know and understand your code base as well as uh, promotions to live servers, that kind of thing. Number seven, restricting cardholder data by business need to know. So if you don't need to know this information, by golly, you shouldn't have it. Uh, it's another one of those best security practices, right? The least permissions needed to get the job done. So obviously, if there's a uh, business need to know, then you, you know, if you need to know some sensitive information or have access to sensitive systems, then you have to do it to do your job. But that kind of thing needs to be documented. We'll learn about documentation here a little bit more as far as the requirements are concerned. Requirement number eight is asking that we, everyone who logs onto a system gets a unique ID, um, something that's fairly important. I know that I've worked on systems often that have an administrator account or people share access to servers. Um, that kind of thing. Everybody needs to have a unique ID because that really comes into play when you're talking about logging. Um, you need to be able to reconstruct where things happen, when things happen, why things happen, who changed what. And if someone does not have their own account, it's much harder for that to be tracked. 
Requirement number nine deals with physical security. You can do it all right from the ones and zeros side of things, but if you leave the door unlocked or keep your server in the break room, um, nothing is stopping someone for picking it up and walking away with it. Um, so physical security is definitely something that might need to be considered if you're in, in your own hosting environment, which I've been before. That's kind of fun. Requirement number 10, uh, you need to be able to track and monitor all network resources and cardholder data. This really comes into play with the logging side of things and the logging requirements that are involved. And then number 11 is the testing of uh, security systems and processes. You'll need that, those official testing procedures in place and documented. And number 12 is all about the documentation. Um, you need information security policies. There is a training requirement for your people, that kind of thing. You need to keep stuff on paper, or at least written down. Here's some of my, my favorite takeaways from the standard itself. My favorite one is you really shouldn't be storing cardholder data unless you absolutely need to. And if you need to, you're probably going to be way cooler than me, and you're going to have uh, some serious security professionals looking at your setup. Uh, the, re the requirement states that you shouldn't source certain types of data. Uh, certainly, the credit card number shouldn't be stored in plain text, uh, but there's also full track data that comes on the credit card, extra information that you may not know that exists as a part of your magnetic strip. Uh, as well as PIN numbers or that CV2, uh, CV2, CVV, that code on the back of your card. Um, that's information that you should never store. The first six and the last four digits of the credit card number are fair game. Um, that's the maximum that should be displayed. Keep in mind that there's a very specific algorithm to credit card numbers, and the more information people have about the numbers that exist, the easier it might be to reconstruct a credit card number based on the information that you have. So the, f the less data that you have, the better off you'll be. This is really the big one. Uh, read through requirement number 12 very carefully. Uh, document everything. If it's not on paper, it never happened. And again, on paper, uh, get it in writing from your vendors and service providers. Uh, frequently, you'll have to work with other companies, be them hosting companies, um, be them your payment processor, or perhaps some other third-party vendors that you need to work with. You need to understand that their compliance, their non-compliance will mean your non-compliance. So you need to make sure that they're doing everything properly from a compliance perspective, because it means that you'll be doing everything compliant correctly from a compliance perspective. This is a process that means you're never done. When you're finished with compliance, if you will, you've, you've, you've gone through all of the proper steps, and you can say, yes, I'm compliant. Keep in mind that tomorrow, if somebody does something, you may not can be compliant. So it, compliance is, the idea of compliance is a snapshot in time. You're always, it's always in motion. You need to always be assessing, remediating problems that you might find, and reporting and documenting that kind of information. Okay, we got through the 12. There will be a test. There will be some math, but don't worry, it'll be too easy. That test comes in the form of the SAQ, the self-assessment questionnaire. There are five different ones depending on what type of business you do. Keeping in mind that the PCI DSS applies to the local gas station as much as it applies to Amazon.com, as much as it applies to Frank's T-shirt store. So here are the five, and here are kind of what they do. But since we're all at DrupalCon, I'm going to knock a couple off the list because they don't involve e-commerce. They're more uh, manual storefront type methods, perhaps even the uh, old school knuckle buster card swipers. But uh, SAQA, SAQC, and SAQD are going to be the tests that you'll take, if you will, uh, to prove your compliance um, when you're dealing with e-commerce. One, one of these three, depending on your particular situation. I'll talk about these three in a little more depth. SAQE has, SAQA has to do with an e-commerce setup where all payment card processing is outsourced. So no sensitive information ever hits your server. It's the most easiest one by far. There'll be about 14 questions covering two of the 12 requirements. Um, it really is going to deal with your physical security if you happen to have access to data and in your information security possible, the po policies the stuff that's on paper documenting that you're doing everything in the proper manner possible. 
SAQA is most likely found in folks who do the whole PayPal, go to the PayPal site and pay the bill, and then you're returned back to your website after the bill is paid. A lot of folks really try to avoid that because they feel that someone wanting to buy something from them site, their site will kind of back out when they go to PayPal and uh, you know the transaction isn't as smooth, that kind of thing. There are some really cool vendors out there now doing tokenization, which allows the sensitive data to be offloaded from your server, but allows a seamless checkout process. Here's a little, a little, ne here's a little network diagram uh, kind of showing how that might work. At the bottom is the user of your website who puts in their credit card information into your form in your checkout. Uh, that, it, that form is then submitted, but instead of going to your website, the sensitive information is then posted directly to the payment processor, who then returns a meaningless token to the user. Oftentimes you'll see that, that was, that's a client-side request. It could be a server-side request, but uh, that meaningless token comes back to the user and then the form is and then immediately posted to your web server with the token as well as any other information that you want at checkout. So your web server then says, hey, I have a token. I also have this secret key that my administrator has set up, so I'm going to give this token and this secret key over to the payment processor. The payment processor is going to say, hey, this is that token I just gave out, and here's that key for my, my favorite merchant, and uh, now I get to charge this person $40 or whatever and then it's returned as successful or whatever back to the user. SAQC is for more of a standard e-commerce setup where you may be uh, sending sensitive data through your server, but you're not necessarily storing, you're not storing your, your sensitive data if you're able to fill out SAQC. It is a little bit longer, 85 questions. It is covering about 11 of 12 of the year requirements. Um, it really has to do with how well you're securing that sensitive data as, and its transfer as well as any sorts of monitoring and testing, and of course the documentation and that kind of thing that comes with the other systems. And because I liked building network diagrams, and that was really a whole lot of fun, it's more of a standard setup, right, where that sensitive data is then sent straight to your web server. The web server turns around and says, hey, I need to make a payment, here's the data uh, to the payment processor. And the payment processor says, great, and then success is returned throughout the chain. SAQG is really the other form. Anyone who may not necessarily fit any of the slots that have been outlined end up with SAQD. Also, if you end up in the world where you're storing sensitive information, you'll end up filling out SAQD as well. It can be fairly, fairly upsetting because it is fairly long and you are getting a full overview of the requirements that I've outlined, uh, 12 out of 12, and it's pretty intense and uh, really looks into how you might be doing sensitive data storage, that kind of thing. But SAQD is something that if you can avoid be, uh, filling out SAQD, it's going to save you a lot of time and possibly expense um, by not storing credit card information and re being required to fill out SAQD, that kind of thing. So along with which SAQ you'll need to fill out, it's also something to note that you'll have a merchant level as given to you by the different credit card brands. There are levels one through four. And sadly, even though the data security standard is one standard to rule them all, each of the merchants have their own slightly different version of what these levels mean to them. But if you are a level to one merchant, you are that same level to other merchants, as long as it's the higher one. So if I'm a level two for one merchant, I'm also a level two for all of the other merchants as well and the levels really dictate what you'll have to do to gain compliance according to the, the, the credit card brand. This is a screenshot taken off of the uh, Visa website dictating those levels and what those levels mean to them. Just note that uh, there's levels one through four and uh, it's asking every, for, for each of those levels uh, that they have a quarterly network scan done by a, an approved scanning vendor as approved by the PCI Council. It also says that you'll, prob you'll have to do the uh, annual SAQ uh, for all of the levels. Level one are folks who do over six million transactions per card type, so that means I'm doing six million and one Visa transactions or MasterCard or Discover Card. Um, 
it will be a full overview of your security procedures, and you won't be able to fill out your own. As, uh, you won't be able to fill out your own self-assessment questionnaire. They will make a uh, a QSA, a qualified security assessor, someone who's been blessed by the council that this person has been trained and they know what they're doing. To uh, you'll have to hire them and bring them in and br make them a part of your process to uh, a compliance. Also, merchants who have had a previous data breach will likely get bumped up to become level one, which can be a very expensive thing for a small business. Level two merchants are doing less trans... Yes, sir, question. Okay, you'll ask later. Level two, you're doing fewer transactions. One thing to point out is that level two merchants have a new June 30th, 2012 deadline that's being sent, uh, sent to, struck, stricken down by MasterCard, saying that uh, your SAQ will have to be done by a QSA, someone who's the you know, PCI professional as blessed by the council, or a certified ISA, an internal scanning person who has received training and they are confident that uh, this internal person can do your QSA properly. So there's some changes coming for level two merchants. Level two merchants will also have to have their quarterly scans done as well. Levels three and four have their quarterly, quarterly scans and they have to complete their self-assessment questionnaire. Um, level four sometimes says, depending on which brand you look at, which Visa, MasterCard, and Discover card are the same, says that the SAQ is recommended. That said, if you take American Express or JCB, their levels are all slightly different, and you can gain a higher level via that shared reciprocity between the brands because you take these card types. Something to keep in mind. This is kind of the bottom line of all of these levels and uh, questionnaires and that kind of thing. It really is going to come down to what your payment processor, or what they call their, the acquiring bank, has, wants you to do. They will have the final say. They will say, you know, we want you to have the scans done, we need you to fill out the SAQ, that kind of thing. Or we need a QSA to do your SAQ. So it, it comes down to the payment processor in regards to which level they want you to be. My goodness, I've been yammering on now for about 30 minutes at DrupalCon and we haven't heard Drupal. That's probably like the first session of the day, huh? Sorry about that, but... I find it necessary to get people up to speed because a lot of times there are some misconceptions in the PCI world and that was kind of necessary to see exactly what we have to do in Drupal to be PCI, but you have to kind of know what PCI is going for in the first place. So how does Drupal work in this PCI world? Drupal is open source, but chances are you have customized it, right? You have custom modules, you have custom themes, that kind of thing. So because those th two things are true, you'll end up treating it like it's 100% your code base. So you'll end up being very familiar with requirement number six, which has to do with the development practices and that kind of thing, code reviews. Um, you're going to have to make sure that you understand your code base because you're treating this like it is your code. You'll have to have folks who can jump in and read through the, uh, the code that makes up your shopping cart. This is code from Drupal Commerce. Can you spot the vulnerability? Huh. Just kidding. I don't know that there's one there. I just... I just copied and pasted something I found. You also have to keep in mind that within Drupal, there are some other dragons that you may need to look for. Um, so where might those dragons be? One thing that I like to keep in mind is that uh, in Drupal, there's this cache form, right? It's the form cache that comes from Drupal's form API. It's a database table that uh, stores form data for multi-step forms and that kind of thing, sometimes validation. What that might be doing for you is sticking sensitive information in your database unencrypted without your knowing that. So you have to be aware of the workflows of the forms that are in play and making sure that it's not sticking data into your form cache. The second thing you definitely want to look for is to make sure you're not doing it wrong in the first place. I suppose the order is wrong here. This would be number one. Don't be doing it wrong in the first place. There's a fairly popular module that exists for recurring billing, and it comes with several different ways that you can do recurring billing. One of those ways is their test gateway, right? So that you can test to see how this API works and perhaps write your own code around it based on this great example. 
Anyway, this great example allows you to stick credit card information in your database and it will just run through the recurring billing on charge uh, on cron when it needs to be charged. So you have a database table full of unencrypted credit card numbers. Um, it sounds like a terrible thing and it sounds like somebody should notice that, but I've heard lots of stories of people coming across that when they've been called in to work on, an, on a commerce site, not a commerce module site, but a, a e-commerce site within Drupal. Um, someone who has misconfigured and misunderstood what that module is supposed to be doing. So you need to make sure that something like that isn't happening in the first place. Another place you might look when you're looking through your code or writing code for your custom applications within Drupal is things sticking information into the session array. And that's a big PHP super global that allows uh, information to be shared across a user's session. Drupal sticks that information into the sessions table in the uh, database. And there you can see you might be able to unknowingly put unencrypted information in your database just because you didn't understand exactly what was going on with Drupal's API or perhaps PHP's session super global. Another Drupal security thing that you might want to keep in, keep in mind when it comes to commerce is cookie session hijacking. There's a really amazing blog post that exists on the secure pages module page, so drupal.org slash project slash secure pages, where you would go download the secure pages module. Um, the secure pages module allows you to configure different sections of your site to be SSL or not be SSL, given your, your server has already been configured to handle SSL or not SSL. So go to that session or go to that uh, project page. There's a great uh, blog post about session hijacking and how you can avoid that kind of thing. If you look through Drupal and start uh, searching PCI within Drupal, of course there's stuff in the in the forums and other you know people asking questions about PCI because there are people a lot of people wanting to ask questions about PCI. It's a confusing thing. There's this PCI update module that exists. I've never actually ended up using it, but I know that it's there. Um, what happens is, is when you have your quarterly scans, they will return things that the scanning, the, the scanning robot didn't like about your site. One of those things that some scanning robots don't like is that the login form of Drupal has the autocomplete turned on, so your browser might be storing those passwords. So the scanning bot says, no, that's not allowed, you can't do that. In order to fix that, it's a fairly straightforward hook form alter, a very short module to be able to change that. That is what this module is, according to the project page. I don't know this maintainer. I'm not sure exactly what his or her plans are. According to the project page, as they come across other issues, they will probably continue to update the module and make changes as needed. Also, you need to have a basic understanding of general Drupal issues when it comes to security and code as well. Cross-site scripting, where you're able to uh, have untrusted users executing JavaScript on your site could be a bad thing. Uh, obviously, SQL injection, where folks can do, thing, do nasty things to your database, may expose, bad, may expose data to bad people, as well as cross-site request forgeries. These are kind of the three most common vulnerabilities found in Drupal modules. Um, being able to understand them and know them and write code so that kind of thing doesn't happen is something that uh, whoever is doing your code reviews needs to be familiar with. I hope everyone here in the room is familiar with the Drupal security team. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the security team. Uh, it's a group of volunteers who uh, work on Drupal websites themselves and they have security knowledge and they're able to help out the community with that knowledge. The Drupal security team receives reports of vulnerabilities on, of Drupal core or from contrib modules and then they deal with those reports. They figure out what needs to happen. They get maintainers involved to fix vulnerabilities. They might jump in and do some work on a Drupal core bug, that kind of thing. The way the Drupal security team works is that Security is handled in private until something has been fixed, at which point it becomes as public as possible. I hope you're all signed up to receive Drupal security updates, either from the Twitter feed that exists, from an RSS feed, or from emails, all of which can be found on the Drupal 
drupal.org slash security to get that information. Great, so now I've all scared the stuff out of you, right? We're, we're worried about what we can be doing wrong. Um, there's a lot we need to know to be able to uh, do it right. Don't be scared. Have a plan, right? Hopefully I can empower you this afternoon in this last little section. Here's my plan. This is what I'd like for you to do if you need to do something about your current status when it comes to compliance. Step one, you need to go to PCISecuritySanders.org. Um, that's the website of the PCI Council. It has the information that you need. Um, you need to download and read the standard. The PCI DSS uh, version two is current. While you're downloading that document, there are two other documents I'd like you to get. Navigating PCI DSS and the glossary of terms and abbreviations and acronyms. Because PCI QSAs like to use lots of acronyms because they're PDQ. Anyway. The navigating the PCI DSS document I think is very vital because as you go through and you read the standard and you later move on and read the questionnaire itself, you need to determine what exactly are they trying to do here. And that is what's in the navigating the PCI DSS document. It really kind of tells the intentions of the council and uh, allows you to understand what they want of you if you're confused. So those three documents, sit down with them together and uh, get reading. I know that's no fun, reading technical documents. The second thing, after you have a, a, a great knowledge base on the PCI standard, is go get the self-assessment questionnaire that fits for you. On that website as well, there will be uh, descriptions about each of the questionnaires, and you need to determine which one is going to probably fit you based on the type of business you do. Do you have credit card information that's crossing your server? It's encrypted when it gets there, but you know that sensitive data is there. Um, you'll likely end up filling out SAQC. If you don't, if you use one of these cool new hot tokenization things and that sensitive data never hits your server, PC or SAQA is probably something that's going to be more likely suited to you. But you need to be able to sit down, read through the questions, and see exactly what they say needs to be done, and you need to determine what you don't have done yet. Um, because the next step is to go get another document, yet another document from that website, which is the prioritized approach to pursuing compliance. They understand that you're not always going to be perfect and that there will probably be problems with your current setups. You need to understand that they also want you to be improving your current setup in order to achieve compliance. You need to find the order of operations in how you should be improving things. So what is more of a problem than something else? If you're deficient in 10 areas, this document will help you rank those 10 areas and make sure that you hit the vital ones first and maybe hit the ones that aren't necessarily as important towards the end. I'm expecting a bunch of questions. So now would be that time. And uh, I've been told that there is a microphone in the center and the folks doing the recording would prefer you use that. Hi, uh, thank you. You bet. Um, my question has to do with uh, the, uh, I guess, the Section A, PCI Compliance, SQAA. Um, and uh, what I'm wondering is, if you use one of these uh, forms that doesn't uh, go directly to your site, but goes to some, some other site, um, don't you still have, I mean, if somebody has J uh, JavaScript or something on, the, you, on the client side, something could still go wrong, so I'm not quite sure why um, it's less relaxed, I guess that's the... Great question. Um, yeah, it is a lot less relaxed if you're using one of these third-party things. The, what it comes down to is you can't be responsible for what's happening on the client side. Your application is designed to act in a certain way, so you need to make sure that it, it, can, it can act in that certain way. Um, people may put themselves at risk if their com own computers have issues. Sadly, the standard can't reach out and touch everyone's browser and make them upgrade, that kind of thing, or ensure that they have virus scans running on their local machines as well. Does that kind of make sense? 
just, uh, I'm just wondering about like um, the issues having to do with, let's say, if you have a, a, a developer adding something to the page, not necessarily something that the user, it's a, it's a problem of the client, but it's, it's, it's coming from your server yet. You know what I mean? It's like, so all of these um, quality controls and checking the, uh, your, you, I'm a, do you still have, I mean, does one still have to do that? That's what I'm wondering about. Yeah. Uh, so what you're saying is, is that you're developing, an, or you're using a certain type of application that doesn't necessarily need the higher level, uh, but it's still a custom rolled application, right. and there's a lot that could go wrong. Right. You're right. And in my opinion, I'd like to see more of a requirement six for bespoke applications um, required. Yeah. It's something that you definitely need to make sure that you're doing right in-house. Um, you'll find that being compliant doesn't necessarily mean you have good security or good practices. It means you're filling out the square, right? You're checking the box. Things are okay. Um, you need to make sure you're doing it well beyond compliance in cases like that. Sir. Hi. Um, I wandered into the, long, into the wrong presentation, uh -huh. and you just scared the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> We're just getting into this. Our boss said, oh, we're going to start selling uh, edu education courses, like continuing education credits on the, on the web. Um, <laughs> I think we did it all wrong. Um, we're small. Um, we, we were saving credit card numbers, and we think that's a bad idea, so we're going to stop doing that. We're using a payment gateway. But we don't have the manpower to figure this out. Where do we go? How, what are we going to do next? The problem is, is th that it's a hard problem to have, mm -hmm. and there aren't a whole lot of easy solutions. Within Drupal, there are some great commerce packages that allow you to do a lot, mm -hmm. but I've never had a commerce install where you haven't had to write your own code at some point. It's something that's going to take manpower. Is what you're doing re requiring recurring billing? No. Or no? Well, we could recurring billing, but we think for simplicity's sake, we'll just ask the client to re-enter his credit card and tell them we're doing it for security reasons and hopefully give them a warm fuzzy at the same time. Yeah, for sure. Um, once again, I can't stress enough, if you can avoid storing credit card data, you'll well, be we much are, better yeah, we're not gonna do, We're not going to do that at all, but they're we'll still going to be entering night. data through a web form and we're then sending that, sending that to a payment gateway. So I guess we want to put in one of these tokenization solutions, right? But we still, we still probably wouldn't pass an audit. It depends. <laughs> um, an audit and a scan are, are different things. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the lower level venue, vendors will be required to do exactly what their payment gateways ask them to do. Well, we so, are, low, we are well, low level, so that's, we're doing very few transactions, okay. maybe, maybe a couple of hundred a month. So you'll have to get in touch with your payment gateway and see what they want of you. Mm -hmm. um, likely they'll want you to fill out an SAQ. Okay. And they'll require a, uh, the outside network scans. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Um, remember that if you're doing something like web form and, and charging a credit card and going through the gateway, mm -hmm. you're responsible for that code. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand what's going on within the web form module. You need to understand what's going on with your custom code or, or you know, if you're using uh, pay module, that kind of thing. You need to understand what's happening there and be responsible for that. And I think it's a good idea too. The bad news is we outsource that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about PADSS, which you obviously clearly made a note to make that disconnected from this, because I feel like some of the questions that they're asking are more PADSS focused. So my question is, going through this process, are they also auditing on PADSS and looking at the solutions for the payment enrollment? Sure. The, do you understand what I'm asking? Are they nested together? So if I go for PCI compliancy, does it depend on license level? Does it depend on the level of what I have to worry about in PADSS? Sure. Am the question I is all about the PADSS, which is the Payment Application Data Security Standard, a just as long and just as complicated document um, as compared to the PCI DSS. Um, the Payment Application Data Security Standard, as I understand it and as I've dealt with in the past, doesn't uh, apply to the sites that I've worked with, and here's why. Um, the payment application data security standard applies to software that's been licensed to third parties and commercial software, that kind of thing. I'm sure there's a better description on the website outlining 
what types of software apply to the PADSS. Doesn't Drupal fall in that, though? Because th that's very gray. Great catch. Yeah. Doesn't Drupal fall in that? It's very gray. Yes, it is uh, third party licensed by the GPL. Right. That said, it, the PADSS does not apply to custom applications. You are tricky, making customizations tricky. to this application that are one off, or perhaps they're bespoke. You know, custom, uh, it's a, it becomes a bespoke application, and you're responsible for the code base. Thanks. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the responsibility and where that lies, whether it be the uh, web designer or developer compared to the store owner. Like, who should be in charge of making sure the site is PCI compliant? Who should be paying for the scans mm -hmm. and filling out the questionnaires? Sure. Great question. Um, I take it, are you a smaller shop kind of thing and you're working with folks building e-commerce, or? Um, yeah, we, we, we're a company building websites for small cool. customers, yeah. So Great. there's a number of stores that we build. Fail. Anyway, yes, the, the, it, it, is, it is kind of a problem space. And you, as someone who's building this website for this vendor, need to understand that you need to keep it not your issue. You're the one who doesn't end up signing the bottom line as the vendor on the SAQ in the end. They need to be responsible and understand that they're the ones who are end up you know, dealing with this information because they're the ones who have this website. They need to end up owning it. Okay, so, so if, if vulnerability was broken through and uh, information got let out, they would go to the store owner for that? Correct. In most cases. And now I'm not yeah. gonna say that they're not going to come to you. Right. At least the store owner isn't. Right. <laughs> but. Okay, thank you. Well, that's the 21st century, right? <laughs> so. um, we're in the process of moving our um, credit card data to a third party, and my question is a couple different pieces. Regarding the hosting the form for the credit card entry from the third party, um, of the different levels between doing it from a page that we host in an iframe versus having them host the form and masking the URL to show our domain versus the final one of having them host the form and showing their domain, for example, that you flip over to PayPal and then before you're coming back to us. Of, I, I obviously I know each in that order they're better, but to stay PCI compliant and keep, the, the, keep everyone happy, how far down can I go on that list? You need to stay away from the trickery with iframes, yeah. for sure. Stay away from the iframes? Stay iframe. away from the trickery with yeah. iframes. And do yeah. I have to show, can I mask the URL to be our domain, or should I show the third party? It's a great question. Uh, I would prefer showing the third party. Yeah, just trying to get another opinion. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thinking of your first slide, and you said you're not a lawyer, so maybe this isn't fair to ask, <laughs> but I'm glad I put that there. <laughs> exactly. We have, um, it, it happens pretty rare. I mean, at, once in a blue moon. But every once in a while, we may have someone who will contact us through our website and just bypass the store altogether and may send us an email talking about this or that and at the end say, hey, can you sign me up for your publication? Here's my credit card information. Short of deleting that and maybe anything on the servers, is there anything else we should be doing to protect ourselves? Are we responsible for anything that malicious may happen? Or, or how would you handle that? Yeah, um, great question. So you're saying uh, some client said, here's my credit card number, and they sent it to you in an yes. email or something. Yes. Boy, don't ever send credit card information in emails. Remember that email is like a postcard, right? <laughs> great question. There was also another question about faxing. That could be the same thing. Sure. And PCI will apply to think, you know, credit cards coming in in the mail or faxes or that kind of thing for sure. You know, people can mail off a credit card. And I'm paying my sure. bill. It just needs to be handled properly. And, you know, you'll have to jump in and read the standard and figure out that kind of thing. But to answer your question um, about email, you know, hey, uh, I really like what you're doing and sign me up. Here's my information. Um, when I was working in a nonprofit organization, one thing that our data folks who sent emails and had the touch points with our constituents regularly, they made sure in their email signature to say, please don't send us credit card information sure. or credit card or other inf uh, sensitive information in emails. Just as kind of that reminder. Another thing that we did as a good policy is we made sure that that email was you know, deleted from everywhere we could find it 
before it got on backups because you end up storing you know, information on backups and, and you, know, you need to do what you can to get rid of it at that point, for sure. I understand, like you said at the beginning, that this isn't like um, you know, law, these uh, compliances, but um, are they covered in like, um, the contracts or agreements that you have with your, your uh, merchant account and so forth? Great question, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's all a part of your contract that says, yes, I'm agreeing that this is the way it's going to be. And they're expecting you to, A, read that and understand what it means. Yeah. Hi. So I'm working at a nonprofit as well. And um, we're in the process of switching over a system where we'll be processing donations on our website. I'm sorry. Can you speak up? Yeah. Um, I'm, we're in the process of switching. I'm short, I didn't stand on my tiptoes. Um, we're in the process of beginning to uh, process donations in our website in the next probably month or so. Um, so we're looking at all the PCI complications. And one of the things you said which unnerved me was we need to own Drupal 100%. We obviously haven't made customizations to all of Drupal and for the areas where we are, our vendors have made customizations, we have most of that documented and pretty well understood. But certainly we don't know the entire Drupal stack and every piece of it. And it seems like a really high bar in general. Do you have any like guidance on where that line really is and how much we need to be able to 100% be able to account for? You need to own your software. That said, you need to be darn sure wherever the credit card is traveling in your software has been done right. It can be depending on your particular implementation or, yeah. Uh, so there's a little bit of a flame war going on on Drupal.org right now about PA DSS, and I don't think we need to engage in it here. Um, but it's around whether or not Ubercart needs to meet PA DSS as a standard. And the comment that you made about, well, if, it's, if, it, if you've modified it, then it's custom code. As far as I understand, if it's custom code, then you need to pay for a third-party code audit to ensure that, that that meets sort of whatever compliance is necessary. And, you know, we're looking at e-commerce options and there's no way, we, we're a small nonprofit, no way we could afford for a third-party code audit of all of Drupal and all of Ubercart. And, and, and if you don't end up modifying Ubercart code at all, then it, it seems really clear in my mind that it is, does have to meet the PADSS requirement, which requires you know, coding practices that will never happen in the open source community. And actually there's a blog post by one of the people who's on the PCI Council talking about open source software, and he makes is that it really- the payment guru? PCI yeah, payment guru. guru, yeah, PCI guru. I'm in that comment thread. Yeah. <laughs> so he, you know, he, he makes, makes the argument that all open source systems need to meet PADSS standards as well. I don't know if you have Until any comments. Until later in but... a comment, he said, unless they're customized. Yes, that's true. And, and then it's going to be a part of your, other, your PCI audit. Yes. And it's going to be more expensive than you would like it to be. You have to pay for the code audit, yeah. In, question, in, in, in times of questions like this, I will refer to you two to a PCI professional. There is a company here today who is on the list of approved vendors, and they also oh, do cool. Drupal. Which one? There's a company here today who's on okay. the approved list of vendors, and they also do Drupal. I have a uh, follow-up to the uh, emailing of credit card information, which obviously in plain text is a no-no. Um, but I mean, per the PCI standard, as long as the data is encrypted across the entire path of the message, it, it should be acceptable. Should be. Um, and one, our client, we have a recent Drupal 7 build and the client required that the credit card information be sent via strong encryption um, to their, their email system. And they were very PCI aware, um, almost to a, to a fault. There is no fault, but you know, to, to an extreme. Um, so not being uh, encryption experts ourselves, we looked for modules thinking that this was a common issue. We looked for modules out there that could perform strong email encryption, whether it be S-MIME or PGP or GPG or something like that. And to our surprise, there were none, uh, at least that we could find. I think there was a Drupal 6 project that was not well supported. So we had to go and, and build our own. I, I guess my question is, did we miss something? 
I mean, this seems like a, a fairly common, you know, email encryption seems a pretty basic thing, and it wasn't too tough to build our own, but obviously ours is not robust. It's not community supported. Um, so I guess my question is, is there a better method that you can think of that would be, you know, PCI compliant? Did we miss something? Um, just looking for, you know, another perspective. I'm, I'm not sure, sure about your use case about sending it over the email. Why, why is it happening in the first place? Why do they require yeah. an email? Um, actually to avoid some of the PCI compliance issues you said. They don't want it stored on the server. They want it, or on the uh, web server, which they consider to be relatively insecure. They consider their email server secure. Um, they also considered that the email would remain encrypted because the entire body is encrypted and it would remain encrypted until the client, you know, on the, on the PC itself had their key and typed in their password. So they, from their perspective, it actually was more secure to be encrypted right off the bat and be encrypted, you know, forever and never be unencrypted. It's a tough problem, and I'm unfamiliar with Drupal and secure encryption modules. Okay. So, sorry, I'm not Th thought I'd ask. That. Thank you. going to increase the height because everyone's so tall here. <laughs> They're all bending down. Uh, okay, so my apologies. I don't know too much about um, the stuff, and that's why I was really interested in what you're talking about now. So I know there's a whole session after this on recurring billing, uh, but one of the slides that did confuse me a little was, uh, I don't know at what stage it was in which you said you can store the credit card numbers, but you can't store the PIN. Um, I don't know what what implications are then uh, in respect to a recurring billing? But what's the point of storing the credit card number without storing the PIN if you if you can't do the if you can't do anything with it? The PIN is designed to be kept separate, so storing the two together is is kind of outside of the way that they, they want credit card data to be stored. So that's just the way that the the council is uh, decided that this is how you need to be handling credit card data. So no. Um, sure, but w what's the point of the credit card data without the PIN if, if we're talking about recurring billing? And it depends so on the payment gateway um, and, and their needs as far as what they need to make a charge. And yes, wonderful session coming up next. My colleague uh, Joe will be uh, speaking about recurring billing and uh, yeah, it, it will be absolutely great. I just wanted to expand a little bit on what you were talking about when the lady from uh, the nonprofit asked you about uh, owning your site and how the credit card, it is a difficult, um, I guess, process, but generally what you're looking for is to make sure that your site is not um, permanently exploitable so that somebody can take your site and create new forms and then therefore control the user interface on your site. Um, and so you can, you can find out what most of the problems with your site are just through security scans and things of that nature. And uh, again, like you said, to pretty much own your site, but you don't have to own Drupal collectively. And I think that, to me, was coming across as, as invoking some fear in some folks here. Point taken. In my opinion, it is a scary thing. So um, I was thinking during the presentation that uh, kind of worrying, actually, because we've done work on Drupal commerce sites uh, from a contract perspective. And uh, I'm assuming if they ever got pulled into court, we would get pulled along with them because there's a documentation process that I'm assuming spreads to every developer that touches the code. Um, and uh, on that note, is there something that you have seen or noticed in the forums? I'm sort of new to Drupal. Um, is there a certain area where people routinely make mistakes that cause um, security compromises. I mean, uh, I'm sure f it sounds like forms API might be an area where people go wild and start making uh, security compromises unknowingly. But is sure. there something that we should look for, especially if it's not a site that we've built? The few things the that place? I've mentioned. Um, if you have a credit card that's being taken in a multi-step form, uh -huh. um, that credit card information is probably being stored someplace yeah. while that request is happening and may hang around in your form cache. Things you need to keep in mind. So the, yeah. the things that I've mentioned, cool. but generally good Drupal security practices as well, ensuring that any sort of user-generated text is filtered properly, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks. Um, having done 
little bit of searching on this before. I've, I've found different answers, um, but I want to know your take on it. There, there's a question on one of the forums that makes it seem that you cannot be PCI compliant on a managed, or not on a managed, but on a shared hosting environment. Is that your take? It's a great question. Um, the latest round of standards has uh, ways that you can become compliant in virtual environments. Um, it's going to be it's going to come down to how the hosting provider is doing it. Um, so yes, there is a recommendation for virtualization, and if they're doing it right, then yes. Um, there are unmanaged VPS type places that do say that their infrastructure has been blessed. Okay. Thanks, our time's up. Have a great day.